Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Lawrence O'Donnell, in for Keith Olbermann. The spiritual father of the Tea Party, Libertarian Congressman and sometime presidential candidate Ron Paul, has weighed in on the controversy over the proposed construction of an Islamic center with prayer room two blocks from where the towers once stood. And in our fifth story tonight, Mr. Paul plainly, powerfully, does the following. One, defends the right to build the center there. Two, dismantles the so-called sensitivity argument. And three, reveals what he thinks is the true motive of the Republican mosque opponents. Mr. Paul issued a statement on his website, the headline, Ron Paul to Sunshine Patriots, Stop Your Demagogy About the NYC Mosque. Mr. Paul has previously drawn Republican anger for standing up against the war in Iraq, U.S. torture, and infringement on personal liberties in the name of safety. But this time, well, you just have to hear this. Quote, the fact that so much attention has been given the mosque debate raises the question of just why and driven by whom. In my opinion, it has come from the neoconservatives who demand continual war in the Middle East and Central Asia and are compelled to constantly justify it. They never miss a chance to use hatred toward Muslims to rally support for the ill-conceived preventative wars. They just want everybody to be sensitive and force through public pressure cancellation of the mosque construction. This sentiment seems to confirm that Islam itself is to be made the issue and radical religious Islamic views were the only reasons for 9-11. The justification to ban the mosque is no more rational than banning a soccer field in the same place because all the suicide bombers loved to play soccer. Defending the controversial use of property should be no more difficult than defending the First Amendment principle of defending controversial speech. But many conservatives and liberals do not want to diminish the hatred for Islam, the driving emotion that keeps us in the wars in the Middle East and Central Asia. This is all he says about hate and Islamophobia. And right on cue came yesterday's protest against the proposed Muslim center. A black man wearing a cap was targeted by protesters and called a coward. Someone shouting, he must have voted for Obama. Someone else, quote, we're against the Muslims, not each other. The man, it turned out, was not a Muslim. And five years after 9-11, Glenn Beck, now railing against the center on Fox News, once appeared with the center's imam, Faisal Abdul Rauf, on ABC News and spoke to Rauf in a way that suggested Rauf was part of the solution, not part of the problem. It is important uh, for all of us to look evil in the eye and crush it. Radicalized Islam is evil. Um, they are uh, they're hijacking a beautiful religion. I believe there is a cancer that is radicalized Islam, and it must be cut out or it's going to kill all of us, including the good Muslims. With us tonight on this issue is MSNBC contributor Melissa Harris Lacewell, also contributing writer at thegrio.com and The Nation, and professor of politics and African American studies at Princeton University. Thanks for joining us tonight, and Melissa. Uh, first, let's start with the phrase uh, Glenn Beck used good Muslim. Uh, we've gone pretty far down the road once we start talking about good Muslims instead of talking about people who, might, who happen to be Muslim who do good or bad things, haven't we? Well, so, you know, let's pause and I'll do my professorial thing and assign everyone a little reading. Uh, so everyone should read the book Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. It's maybe three or four years old now, but it certainly would speak directly to these issues. Um, but, you know, when I hear Good Muslim, it, it resonates with me with, with a history of similar kinds of uh, terms. Good Negro, 
nice girl. Um, both of those terms, when people were called good Negroes or good colored folks or were called nice girls or good women as compared to, for example, feminist or civil rights workers, it was a way of suggesting that a person from a group that is an outsider group, when they conform to the interests of the state, are necessarily defined as good. And the reason we want to be careful about that is not only, as you say, that, that individuals should be judged based on their actions, not on their identity, but also because as soon as you do that, you make it impossible for that person th to then act as a bridge to the very community to which you're hoping to speak. So if you call someone, for example, a good Negro, then it's pretty easy for those who are in the civil rights movement to say that person is no longer relevant to us. We don't want to work with them in terms of building uh, you know, th these bridges. So if you label people things like good Muslim, by which you mean someone who agrees with me, Glenn Beck, you make it impossible for him to do the work of building the bridge. And isn't there a presumption in the cultural semantics of a phrasing like good Muslim or good Negro that those people are not normally good and if you're talking about if you're talking about one that is good you must specify that because that's that's the exception yeah a absolutely I mean it, it's a bit uh, it's a bit like suggesting that there's an oxymoron there and, and therefore it's worth you know pointing out like a like a reasonable conservative like like Ron Paul <laughs> has been this week <laughs> now uh, Melissa the ugliest scene from the protest yesterday a black man wearing a tight cap assumed to be a Muslim besieged by a mob what did you see in that scene? Well, again, this is emblematic of what um, many Muslims in America will tell you occurred in the, uh, in the weeks and months and years following 9-11. Now, overall, I think our nation did a, a generally good job about not sort of creating a set of policies that pushed out our um, Muslim brothers and sisters. But there were always these individual acts of hate that occurred. And often these individual acts of hate um, were against people who were misidentified as Muslims. So, um, for example, people who, who were Sikh. Um, and because Americans just don't know very much about the distinctions between these religious cultures, uh, you know, they were misidentified and, and, and um, victimized by hate speech or hate crime. So what I see there is, is emblematic of that kind of thing. And it's also very scary. It, it is precisely the opposite of where I'd hoped we'd be going as a nation after the 2008 elections. Now, it seems to have fallen to uh, Republican gadfly Ron Paul Paul to make the clearest, unequivocal statement any politician has made who has spoken on this subject. Well, what do you make of Congressman Paul's statement, and why is he alone so seemingly fearless in the face of this controversy? I got to say, you know, it, rare is the day where, um, you know, I'm really cheering a Ron Paul uh, <laughs> uh, blog, but I got to say I was when I was reading this, and, and I, I was laughing thinking about the fact that I still carry in my purse a copy of the Constitution that Ron Paul handed to me on a Manchester, New Hampshire street corner uh, during the 2008 uh, uh, primaries. And, you know, and I'll say that the thing about Paul here is that he is doing precisely the opposite of Beck. He is calling Americans to our highest and best ideals. And, and the point about American America's best ideals isn't that we all agree on one set of policies or one ideological position. It's not that we will all become progressive, um, but rather that what we agree on is a, is a set of precepts about how we engage one another in our social, political, and economic world. Now, you know, I'm more um, interested in, in some issues of egalitarianism and justice, and, and, and Ron Paul is more interested in issues fundamentally of liberty. But those two, that, that concern about justice and about liberty, about equality and freedom, those are the core American principles. And when you call Americans back to that, instead of appealing to the very lowest common denominators of ethnic anxiety and, and racial and religious hate, that's when you end up with an American public discourse that can be about ideas, can be about real policy, and no longer has to be about this sort of fear-mongering and stereotyping. MSNBC contributor Melissa Harris Lacewell, also contributor at thegrio.com and the Nation, and of course, professor at Princeton University. Thanks for your time tonight, Melissa. Always nice to talk to you, Lawrence. Let's turn now to Bobby Ghosh, Deputy International Editor for Time Magazine, who has covered this issue for Time. Uh, Bobby, what do Sarah Palin and Newt Gingrich do now, now that Ron Paul has used a conservative property rights argument on them?
You'd think that this would give them pause, Lawrence, but my suspicion is that they will be looking at the polling numbers and they will, th they will feel confident that they represent a very large chunk of America when they, when they speak against Islam the way they've done. Our polling shows that four out of ten Americans regard Islam in a negative light. Four out of ten Americans don't believe, as Glenn Beck apparently does, that Islam is a beautiful religion. 25% uh, of Americans say American Muslims are not patriotic. Those are the kinds of people I think uh, the likes of, of Gingrich and Palin are appealing to. That is, the, that is their vote bank, if you like. You know, to the polls, Ron Paul specifically addressed the polls in his statement, saying that they are absolutely irrelevant. He said, majorities can become oppressors of minority rights as well as individual dictators. Statistics of support is irrelevant when it comes to the purpose of government in a free society protecting liberty. How do, do people like Newt Gingrich, who claim to be historians, who claim to know something about our history, not know that? It's, I, do, I don't think that he doesn't know that. I think he's making a calculation based on a very narrow window. He's looking at an election uh, uh, two months from now, and then perhaps he's thinking about w what he wants to do uh, for a presidential run. I, I think uh, no sane person can be unaware of the, of the great sweep of history and, and how over uh, the centuries, time and time again, hate speech has taken the very small leap from speech to violence. But the, uh, also, unfortunately, throughout history there have been people who thought they could tame this monster or make it work to their advantage and I suspect the people like Gingrich are doing that now. Now uh, does Ron Paul's statement indicate a possible split in uh, the Tea Party movement uh, between uh, libertarians like Ron Paul and uh, conservative so-called values voters that Gingrich is trying to lead? I think they've always they've always been I, I think you know we, we make a mistake when we regard the Tea Party as one homogenous a monolithic group. There have always been differences. I've been quite astonished that since our cov cover story on Islamophobia in, in Time magazine this week, we've, I've had people who identify themselves as Tea Party members say to me that they are in favor of the mosque. Uh, and, and clearly Ron Paul uh, is taking the, a similar line. Whereas there are people from the Tea Party who in Temecula, uh, California brought dogs to a protest against Friday prayers, uh, uh, showing a, a, a sort of very deep-seated uh, anger and hatred. So I suspect that that we will discover going forward that this that this group, the Tea Party, is, uh, are capable of, of more than one single thought. Sometimes in these kinds of movements, there is that moment, there is that image that changes the dynamics going forward. Uh, I'll never forget in Boston during the school busing crisis, uh, some white protesters attacked a black man with an American flag, actually trying to stab him with the point of an, of an American flag pole. Uh, from that point forward, the protest in Boston was viewed totally differently, and you can trace Boston's finding its way out of that controversy from that moment forward. And I wonder if yesterday, uh, when they, uh, 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 you know, went after this black man on the presumption that he was a Muslim simply because of uh, his headwear uh, and because he didn't look like the rest of them, is that the kind of ugly moment that can make people involved in this step back and say, wait, we've gone too far? One can only hope, uh, Lawrence, one can hope and, and, and you know, from, from your lips to God's ears, as they say. The trouble is that the kinds of people who bring dogs to a, to a Friday prayer, knowing full well uh, how that will be perceived, it seems to me that those kinds of people are not likely to be, uh, uh, their, their sentiments are not likely to be turned by what we've seen in that video, especially not while they have people like Gingrich and Palin and others who are, who are egging them on, who are championing their cause. That, I, I hope uh, uh, people take pause and step back and re-examine their positions, but my suspicion is that is not what will happen. Bobby Ghosh of Time Magazine, thanks for your analysis tonight. Anytime. Coming up.